from fabulous Las Vegas, Nevada, this is Pod Therapy. Real people, real problems, real therapists. If you have any questions you'd like to ask or advice you'd like to give, come on over to podtherapy.net and join our conversation. Jim says, I never have good openings, so I didn't even bother writing one for today. What's new? <laughs> How do you like that? <laughs> and now, broadcasting from Level 9 Studios, that guy is Dr. Jim Jobin. I'm Nick Tangeman. It's time for some pod therapy. My favorite part of our ritual for getting ready for this podcast is watching you furiously scribble in pen different ideas and then cross them out angrily <laughs> and then write another one. It's yeah. like, whatever. <laughs> you had a week to think about it. I did, yeah. Well, I, I, yeah, I always procrastinate. Yeah, well, well done. And and this time you actually have a working phone. So, you know, you could like look I do, up yeah. Something. So I know everybody is really concerned. Yeah. Um, I thought for the longest time that my phone was destroyed. Yeah. Um, turns out it works and it just, no one calls me. The bag so, of friends. <laughs> <laughs> it was, turns out it's been I working all I, along. Yeah, I guess it was fine the whole time. <laughs> super was, weird. Yeah. Just no one really cares. thought I was disconnected. So, and, uh, that's, uh, no emails, no texts. Yeah. Nothing. My ego is hurt, but my phone is fine. Yeah. Well, I think a bag of rice can fix both. So, yeah. you know, <laughs> just go make you some rice yeah. and just as you're spooning it in, you know, it'll sap up the tears. It'll be fine. But, yeah. I was pretty worried, but it's all good. Yeah. Congrats on your working phone, Nick. Uh, Thank that's a big victory, and I know that that's something that's really important to your world. So, I'm grateful. It was the break from it, though. Honestly, was really nice. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Like not having to touch it. Yeah, to just to just uh, you know set it down for a day and, right. and have no access to it. Yeah, to leave the house and th- like that was kind of the scary part, which was oh, really yeah. weird because I was driving away and I was thinking like all these thoughts were started racing in my mind. Right. Like, well, what if you get into an accident? Right. Like, what if, what if you need to take pictures of something or, right. or if you need to get the driver's information? Like, uh-huh. like none of that happened. <laughs> oh yeah. Before, you know, that's really 1998. interesting. I, I panic even when I don't have service for a little bit. So like there's grocery stores and movie theaters that I know I don't have service. I'll intentionally not go to those. Like it, it bothers me. Like my wife and I, we celebrated our 12 year anniversary this last weekend and we went to uh, Lake Las Vegas. And for non-locals, there's this like outskirts way deep in suburbia, uh, little like amazing man-made lake and like beautiful resorts and stuff this little village and mostly it's just for las vegans who are sick and tired of las vegas right. and they drive 20 minutes <laughs> like just go there like yeah. there's not one person there that's not literally from down the road from me and like europeans for some reason also find their way there but when we were there we had no cell phone service and so it was wild because we're just like talking <laughs> and like sitting poolside and like you know just just discussing life and just how are you and you can't check like Ugh, we couldn't check must our have been horrible it was it's really bad but luckily i got back to my phone in time to uh defame you on twitter so i was grateful for that did you see our did i see it of course screenshot? i saw it yeah. yes of course i saw it <laughs> Com- taken completely out of context uh, you know makes it sound really know? creepy but it know? was it was actually just as creepy in context in context it's just fair. as weird so, so yeah. yeah uh i i have a habit of taking screenshots of Nick's conversations as we're texting back and forth and then selectively editing them so that it's just perfectly weird and then putting that online without his knowledge. Very one-sided. Yeah. Yeah. But I I blocked out your number. You're welcome. Oh yeah. That was responsible. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Jim's tweets are fair and balanced. Yeah. (laughs) That's right. I'm, I'm everybody's source for news. So, uh, speaking of fair and balanced and speaking of the way you interact (laughs) with your coworkers, (laughs) there is a, there's new research that's coming coming out. And this one's actually really, really interesting. Mm -hmm. The title of this research, or at least the piece, is uh, Sucking Up to Your Boss Has Big Workplace Consequences More Than Sciences. And so this is really interesting. So uh, in uh, the journal, uh, what was it? Oh, Applied Psychology. In Applied Psychology, Anthony Klotz, Lawrence Houston uh, did this study in which they basically wanted to figure out uh, if if, if you're a brown noser, (laughs) if you're like constantly kissing the butt of your boss, what effect does that have? Like, does that have an emotional, biological, mental effect on you? And like, do you report that it's even helpful? So one of the things they were trying to take a look at is uh, this thing that came out of an earlier study in the 90s, which resulted in this thing that we call in psychology the ingratiator's dilemma. So the ingratiator's dilemma is this theory saying that people in positions of power are actually more likely to perceive your attempts at flattery 
uh, as self-serving and duplicitous, right? So if you're constantly kissing their butt, they know. They're, they're like aware that other humans in their life don't talk to them like this. And you're constantly right. laughing at their jokes and it's always this forced kind of enthusiasm and you're always flattering them and you're supportive of every idea they have. And if you're that way, most bosses report that they – sense that and it, it seems inauthentic and so therefore it's the ingratiator's dilemma in that you're trying to improve your stake but you actually end up wounding your stake and decreasing your credit in that person's mind about you they actually don't like you so this study tried to follow up on that and basically said okay we already know how bosses feel let's learn more about what it's like for the human who actually does this so they took 75 mid-level managers in this software company and basically they divided them in two groups and they had one group attempt to stand out to their bosses by bragging like bragging about their accomplishments just kind of like throwing it out there like oh yeah i nailed that project or yeah i'm doing awesome and you know i'm killing it or whatever and then they have the other group do traditional brown nosing butt kissing you know constantly flattering ha ha you're so smart you're so funny uh man it's great to have a good leader like you everything's awesome so the results of the study were interesting the brown nosers reported being more mentally depleted at the end of every workday and, and a lot of them described it was from the effort of not just kissing the butt of somebody they probably don't actually respect, but trying to make that seem authentic. Right. Because if it's detected that you're full of it, you end up in the ingratiator's dilemma, which your efforts – double back on you, right? Like your effort, you put in one, you know, credit of flattery, it ends up taking away three credits in their mind because they don't like you. Like you're inauthentic and, and you just seem like you're duplicitous. The study also revealed that brown nosers were more likely to engage in workplace deviance. So workplace deviance is things like surfing the web instead of doing your job, Skipping meetings, uh, calling in, cutting out early, coming in late. And, and that's interesting because these are the same people trying to like win the approval and praise of their boss. Uh, and so they're being like inauthentic and brown nosing. But we notice that those people also tend to be the ones who cut corners and tend to be the ones who kind of phone it in on the effort. But the study also revealed that the exception to both of those rules, that people would feel exhausted from being inauthentic and that they would you know, also engage in workplace defiance, the exception to that was if you found a brown noser who actually tested very highly for political intelligence. If they had high political intelligence, they're basically a natural master manipulator. That's how they live. Like it's not weird for them to be like to appear authentic or like, you know, to not be. And so those people actually didn't report any uh, experience of fatigue or, uh, you know, cutting corners. They just showed up to work. That's actually just who they are. So the study has big ramifications. I think it tells us we already knew that bosses uh, that are being flattered all the time and sucked up to experience that ingratiator's dilemma where they actually resent you and they don't they don't find you useful, valuable or, you know, particularly interesting because they actually come to resent you a little bit and they kind of avoid you. But what we're seeing is on the other side of the line, it isn't good for you. If right. you're a butt kisser, not only are you not going to get the results you want, you're going to be exhausted. You're more likely to underperform at your job. And so it's actually better to approach this from any possible other angle than butt kissing. Right. Like uh, genuineness. Yeah. Being genuine. <laughs> yeah. Imagine that. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I was also wondering, too, with the political intelligence or the people who are master manipulators. So they the, – the researchers studied for this or, mm -hmm. or they, they looked for it. So there were certain traits that they looked for. What I was kind of interested in is – what about the individual's perception of themselves mm. as a master manipulator oh. or, or as having high political intelligence? Yeah. So, so for example, I know some people who could look at this study and think, yeah, I'm absolutely a brown noser. Right. But I have really high political intelligence. I'm good at it. Yeah. yeah. When other coworkers maybe like, no, no, you know, you don't. Yeah, we notice it. <laughs> it's not as it's not as good Gosh, as you think. It's it is. funny because early in my career, I was a very big brown noser. Like it was a problem. And it's something that like, God, it's always backfired. Like I cannot look at one time in my life and say, you know what, sucking up to them, uh, flattering them, making them feel great. That won things for me. No, it didn't. I remember whenever I was at another rehab, the one that I was at before the one that we were mm -hmm. just at. Uh, there was a, a very important doctor on the team and this doctor was well known, a great author. You know who I'm talking about. Yep, I know you're talking and about. during the very first clinical staffing, 
I made a joke at his expense. And, like, I was brand new. Like, it was first week. <laughs> and he was very important. Like, he was almost the boss, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, he certainly had, you know, uh, power over my life. And I was this new therapist. And uh, I made a joke at his expense. And, unfortunately, it was way too funny. And, like, everybody cracked. And it was one of those things where it's like he's so powerful that he has picadillos. He has little things about him. But we don't make fun of that because he's too powerful, right? right. And here I am, a new guy, thinking I'm going to break the ice. <laughs> So, like, I take a shot at, like, the first observation I have about him, and it killed, but he was pissed. <laughs> like, so, it was bad. My supervisor so you... comes to me afterward and, like, tunes me up and is like, dude, <laughs> you need to understand, you know, Dr. So-and-so is very important, very powerful, does not have this kind of, like, you know, humor. And I was like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So I tried to kiss this doctor's butt for, like, a month, overdoing it, trying to dig myself out of the hole. I'm ashamed to admit this, but I really did this. I went and bought the doctor – a very nice pen and had it engraved <laughs> with his name. I'm cringing just listening <laughs> to this And I wrote story. a card <laughs> in a desperate oh attempt God. to win his affection. It did not work. He hates me to this day. Yeah, yeah, You're yeah. kidding. My brown nosing has so, always failed. So your attempt being the new employee, <laughs> yeah. what ended up happening is yeah. you took the old uh, – the old uh, – prison philosophy uh take down the biggest guy yeah yeah Yeah. turns out that is (laughs) (laughs) ill-advised that is ill-advised in a in a healthcare (laughs) or employment setting but not only did that backfire but then kissing his butt backfired but it's interesting because i've also been on the other side of the desk like i you know you and i have both been in supervisor roles where we have employees Mm -hmm. and that can number you know into the dozens And uh, we've both had interns, you know, people that really want us to mentor them or to lend our licenses to them and help them grow or or give them opportunities. And I know for me, anytime I've ever had somebody that's like a real butt kisser, and I've come to you before and laughed about it. I'm like, can you believe this person like is like that? It is so inauthentic that it's a turnoff. Mm -hmm. I feel awkward in that person's presence. I don't even – I'm not flattered by it. Like I don't like it. I have met leaders that probably are because they're very insecure, very shallow, and like they probably need a a cheerleader. But if you're a really decent leader and like a good boss and you've actually earned your role, those suck-ups are insulting in a sense. It's like I I just don't feel comfortable in their presence. Right. So – we no longer work together. Yeah. Our but what's interesting not... is we have worked together in multiple settings. In one setting, you were my supervisor. And in the yeah. other setting, I was yours. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so we've had that that dynamic both ways. And I can I can go on the record and say, Nick in no way, shape, or form kisses ass. He doesn't give a <laughs> damn what you think. <laughs> He's the most self-secure guy on the floor. He does not care. <laughs> you're You're not completely wrong. <laughs> It's not that I don't care. <laughs> That's not I do care. Disregard. But uh but yeah, I mean I um I, I do see myself as a bit of a suck up in some sense. Do you really? Yeah. Not to um, me. You never gave a crap what I thought. No, I don't know. It was collaborative, no, though. In yeah. both roles, I think it was collaborative. Yeah. I think that it was like this is our project. Right. We're gonna. We're both in this together. Either it right. goes up or it goes down. So who cares? Yeah. But no, I would say I'm very authentic in the yeah. sense that if I have a concern or something, I just say it and yeah. But in what way do you see yourself in the past having done that a little bit? Um, in the sense that I, I. Oh, okay. Here's a good example. I'm. I'm more politically correct in things than sometimes I should be. Okay. That's how I see it. Okay. I see it that sometimes You're there delicate. are th- – Yes. I am I can be overly delicate with something. I in think fact, that's a good idea. I don't think that's a bad idea <laughs> When at in all. fact, I definitely absolutely 100% disagree with something. Yeah. But I – sometimes I feel like I overcorrect and become too – Soft. And uh, okay, gentle. I can I can see where one would feel that way, but I'll tell you this: the, the the data that we're looking at in this study talks about not only is sucking up to your boss not going to get you ahead in life. Your boss has the ingratiator's dilemma where they mm, don't actually right. like you; it backfires. But you will end up being a, a, a less uh, effective worker, and also you'll usually be unhappy and more fatigued and right. drained at your job. And in that sense. That didn't apply to me. I don't. Yeah, feel. you yeah. never felt. So that I way. never felt. Yeah, I never felt I was that much. Right. That much of a. But I want to be clear to the listener: the data in no way implies that the opposite has the opposite effect. That if you are uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. cantankerous <laughs> yeah. and antagonistic to your boss, that you'll be happier and more effective at work. Like that's that's also not the case. So 
I'm a big believer in don't uh, look for conflict that you can avoid. Step around it. Uh, plant ideas for your leader to find and let them sort of self-discover. Be available to give them, you know, consultation, but don't come out and correct them. And that's just because I know humans. Like I think being a therapist and then working in corporate settings is very empowering because you know how humans are. Mm -hmm. And even if they're a confident, good boss, you know not to provoke, you know, their insecurities or make them feel less than or anything. Like my my role, every boss I've ever had, I've I've – if I have an error, it's that I, I might suck up. But the middle ground that I've discovered for myself, and I found it to be pretty effective historically, is that I am somebody you always look forward to seeing. That's my goal. If you are my boss, you should never feel like you want to avoid me because mm -hmm. you don't like mm -hmm. my encountering me. You don't like my feedback. Uh, I don't want you to hesitate because if you hesitate and we're not talking anymore, then you're not going to call me when you have directions for me. You're not going to give me feedback and you're going to start valuing uh, interacting with somebody who's not me. And that person's going to take my job, you know? Mm -hmm. So, like, I've always tried to go with the advice of be approachable, uh, be somebody that's easy to get along with, and be somebody who's effective at what you do. Um, and then find subtle ways to highlight what you do. That's one thing I, I'll say about you because, like, the second set of people in the study bragged about what they do. I've told you in life, I'd like to hear you brag more because you don't. <laughs> like, you're the, the no. worst person in the world at, like, highlighting your own victories. Like, you'll win the ball game and just go right back to the locker room and start figuring out the next one. And it's like, <laughs> dude, hit the press conference. Like, you know, <laughs> talk about the victory. How'd you get the W? But you never take credit uh, for things. Whereas me, I am more than happy to take credit for me, you, that guy. <laughs> if I was aware that somebody else right. was working on a project, I'd, I'd take it. I'm like, you know what? We, it was a great team effort. Team effort. Yeah, <laughs> I'm really all, proud of yeah. everybody. Everybody stepped up. <laughs> the victory speech. Yeah. Yeah. How did it all come down? You know, everybody contributed a little. I mean, so did I. <laughs> yeah. That project was in another state, you know, but I was real proud of them. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I was there with them in spirit. So, But I do think that's a, that's a learned skill, right, Nick? You have to have agree. that ability to sort of broadcast your own success because, you know, you can't wait for other people to notice it in life. You have to find a way, and this goes to the listener – since we're talking about life advice and the study of workplace politics and how do you get ahead, you know, one piece that I'll offer you is this. Aside from this study, it is very important that you find a way to subtly highlight your achievements. And if you're uncomfortable doing that naturally, vocally in normal interaction settings without, you know, because it's very hard to master that skill. Like mm -hmm. I would say I'm pretty high on the political abilities scale. So I can like subtly place like these reminders to people that I'm doing things and winning at things and achieving things. But one thing I, I recommend to everybody is to do a year in review for yourself. Right mm -hmm. around the time that right. your annual review is coming, I recommend that as soon as you start your job, you open up a Word document and you just start keeping track of victories, keeping track of projects you were handed that you succeeded at, uh, ways that you went above and beyond. Keep track of everything. And then whenever you get to that one-year mark, about two weeks before the time you think your annual review is coming, if your company does that, and regardless, even if they don't, go through that list, trim it down to really good things because obviously you were very generous to yourself. Highlight the things that really matter, make it a one page little bullet pointed list and just call it year in review uh, and just, you know, achievements and then have another section that says areas I'm looking to grow mm -hmm. and, and just kind of identify some areas that, you know, your boss would nod their head at and say, yeah, that'd be great if you continue to grow in that. And then, you know what? Submit that in unprovoked. And bring that in and say, oh, I know we're getting ready for the annual review. I've uh, just prepped this, so I wanted to go ahead and get this to you as you're preparing for our annual review. And that's just a great way to sort of passively put it in front of them that you're somebody that you know notices yourself and kind of remind them of who you are right around the time that they're going to be discussing whether or not to give you a raise. Right. That's a really good idea. <laughs> One, did you ever see the movie Coneheads? Oh, yeah. yeah. Dan Aykroyd, yeah. Yeah. I, I, as I was reading through this, the person who stuck out in my head was the character played by David Spade. Oh, yeah. The he suck was, up. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> it's like anytime, the FBI suck up yeah. to Michael McKeon. Yeah, yeah. So anytime somebody has him, oh, you better let me take this. He's in a bad mood. Yeah. Oh, look, sir. Look what I, I brought found. this to you. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That is a great example. But, yeah, I mean, I guess my my advice, my feedback to this, too, the, the way that I always approach things is I want to be – the guy that relieves stress yeah. for my boss. Right. I, I want to be the guy that will allow my boss to say, who's working on this? 
Oh, Nick's got it. Okay. Nick's got it. Don't have to worry about Don't it. Don't even look it's over your shoulder. Like yep. that to me is the highest form of compliment. Yes. If I can achieve that, I am very fulfilled. I think that's true. And, mm-hmm. and, but I will come alongside you because I think there's listeners that hear that and nod their heads and go, yep, that's a Midwest, uh, work ethic, <laughs> you know, get in there, you know, carry your load. Don't complain, mm-hmm. throw another sack on your back and carry through my only note for that. Cause I love that, right? I mm-hmm. love that kind of coworker. We've worked together a bunch of different times. It's a competent coworker and, you know, it's great to share space with that kind of a person. Um, and I think it's the right kind of person for your organization. But my my note to that is a note that I've told you a million times. Don't always do it silently. You know, whistle while you work a little bit. Like that way, because that's the thing is you never broadcast. You you'll do it, and suddenly somebody will look over their back and go, Nick has five sacks on his back, and he's just carrying it. And you don't complain either. You won't come in and go, ah, I'm miserable. But yeah, you probably are burdened, and you know you're probably sweating it out. And there needs to be a subtle and you know kind of artful way to broadcast value to your organization because you are. And like, that was one thing when we worked together in different organizations, I knew how valuable you were, but there were other people that didn't. And like there, it it was important to broadcast that, to advertise in a subtle way that you bring a lot to the team. And and that's a really difficult art to master. I think for anybody, because then for every guy like you, that's carrying five bags and doesn't say a word about it. There's another guy that's carrying one grain of rice and he acts like he's freaking mother Teresa. (laughs) And, you know, he's God's gift to the program, God's gift to, you know, the agency or whatever the company. And everybody has that coworker who's a blowhard. And a lot of times they get promoted and it's ironic. Squeaky wheel gets the grease. It does. And you know what, guys, (laughs) if you've got a coworker like that, if you've experienced that, I'll speak to that for one second and just tell you the reason that works is the same reason people buy Coors Light advertising. (laughs) (laughs) It's just definitely not the, it's not the flavor. It is advertising. And you know, when people have to make a decision, they have to fill a role, they have to fill a new promotion uh, role or somebody is going to advance. They, they run through their mind and they just pull up a mental profile of each person. And each of us sort of has a credit score. And if you think about it, credit has very little to do in life with what you've actually achieved. It has a lot to do with your reputation Mm -hmm. and reputation management is something each of us has to think about whenever you're interacting with your boss, try not kissing up to them. That's usually not effective. Um, try subtly. I don't like the word bragging, but I I like, um, uh, sort of not hiding, not Mm -hmm. hiding my achievements, right? Uh, updates is a great way to do it. Uh, just an email or a check-in during a work meeting going, Hey boss, just want to give you a couple of quick updates. I knocked out task a task B and uh, task C ended up turning out way better than I thought it would. So things are looking good. Mm -hmm. And, And another, uh, fun little work idea here, never seem beaten. Never seem beaten, never seem exhausted. A lot of people, they make the mistake of trying to advertise their value to their boss or to their leadership by showing how fatigued they are because they want the person to Mm. see them like a marathon runner and go, wow, look at them sweating it out. Look at them putting in a million percent. Uh, That's a real player. We got to reward that. We got to feed that, you know, horse because it's really panting in in the sun. Ironically, it has exactly the opposite effect. You seem weak. Right. And and so there's this mentality shift where they, they put you in a box. They say, oh, that person's not doing very well. Should we promote them? No, they can't handle more. They can barely handle what they're at. Right. That person's, you know, dogged. And so it has an opposite effect. So my, my advice to you on that point is always seem like you've got it. Never, never show weakness to your boss. And I know that that sounds like not something a therapist would tell you, but you know, I'm also a life coach and like, I want you to succeed. And that's great advice. It's always seem like you've got it. If they go, Hey, can you handle that project? Yeah, I got it. And then, you know, go cry in the bathroom, <laughs> like, right. or talk to a coworker and like vent to them. Like when Nick and I worked together, I'd come to him and go, Oh my God, you know, how am I going to solve this? But you know, to my boss, I'd always be like, yeah, no problem. I'll figure it out. I've got it. Let me worry about that. I'll, mm-hmm. I'll give you an update in a week, you know, and like, that's where you leave it. So a little yeah. bit of life advice there. Yeah. So uh, to our listeners, write in. Um, I'm interested to hear your guys' take on this. Um, how how do you handle things like this in the workplace? How yeah. do you handle suck ups? Are you one? Do you identify yeah. this? Or I'm sure everybody knows somebody in their office or at their job 
that does this. Yeah. How does this affect you as a coworker? Write in. I really want to know. And I'd like a lot more workplace questions because, I mean, I know as therapists, people think of us as like, hey, let's talk about depression. Let's talk about substance abuse. Man, I love navigating, you know, mm-hmm. the, the political and interesting obstacles of life. And man, write in with those kinds of questions, guys, because I got a whole bag of tricks that I would love to <laughs> hand off to you. I had somebody ask me a question yesterday about resumes and how to apply. And I was like, all right. You know, and I started like giving him all of my tips. And he's like, dude, who thinks about it this much? And I'm like, I, I don't know. But I have like a whole cheat sheet of like different techniques that you can do to get ahead. And so mm-hmm. anyway, write in with those questions, guys. But um, yeah, great study, great information. And uh, don't kiss your boss's butt too hard. And then Nick has a famous saying. That, oh, yeah. What's your, your Iowa saying about toes? The, the uh, oh, the toes you step on today may be connected to the ass you have to kiss tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. So always play fair. Don't make enemies. That is another one of my golden rules in a workplace. I never make an enemy and I yep. never speak down to anybody, even if they deserve it, because that guy could be my boss in a week. So yep. I don't want to live like that. <laughs> All right. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we have some listener mail about feeling stuck. You're listening to Pod Therapy. Do you hate ads and podcasts? Yes. So do we. (laughs) That's why there aren't any in pod therapy. But eventually, we'd like to fill this ad space with short messages from real listeners who help sponsor the show. So start thinking about what message you'd want here. Maybe we'll read it for you, or maybe you can leave a voicemail and we'll just play that. Either way, Pod Therapy wants to be a listener-driven, listener-supported show, and we hope you'll think about filling the space with a personal message from our audience. Thanks for listening. We're back. You're listening to Pod Therapy. Our first listener mail comes to us from a listener, Manuela, who reports feeling stuck. Another 20-something feeling stuck. How lame. (laughs) Good title. Hi, Nick and Jim. I've been listening to the podcast for a while now, and I'm proud to say that I'm up to date with the episodes. Wow, man. Good for you. (laughs) And I apologize for any, you know, aneurysm I may have caused. (laughs) All right. So this is probably my fifth time trying to write. I usually start most likely in the middle of a particularly demanding task at work and give up a few sentences in. So I'll do my best to finish this time. Just so you know who you're talking to, I recently graduated from university, have been working at the same company for about three years. I started as an intern in 2015 and got hired in a different department four months ago. And I hate my job. I hate it. We all know this is not what I want to do. It's a stepping stone. But I hate it so much it's sucking all my ability to cope with life. Today I cried reading two emails from people I cared about telling me that I will be able to leave this place soon. Adding insult to injury, my boss is really hard to deal with. People think I'm joking when I say we have an abusive relationship, but I'm not. I'm always trying to not wake the beast, so I do my job as best as I can, never letting anybody know how bad it makes me feel. I've been stifling my feelings so hard to not show any emotion at work that I usually get home and cry for the most stupid reasons. And I hate that too. I was in the best moment of my life. I am, actually. I'm healthy. Have been able to manage my chronic illness with a lot of success. I just finished brilliantly a very important phase of my academic career. I have a great family, supportive friends, and I recently fell in love with the most amazing guy. And this brings me to another piece of the problem. He lives in another country. I want to leave my country. Not because of him. This has been a plan of mine since I was a kid, but now obviously encouraged by this relationship. Let me tell you, long-distance relationships are hard, and it's becoming unbearable. I just feel like I need to go. I'm so unhappy that it's hard to concentrate on work. All my free time is now dedicated to trying to find a way to move. To the U.S., by the way, which is probably insane considering who's in charge there. (laughs) I wake up thinking about it. I go through my days shoving down all my angst and feeling stuck. This is important. I feel stuck and I don't even know if I actually am. And I go to sleep fantasizing about already being there. I'm trying really hard to focus on the task at hand, surviving this job and doing my best to make plans come true. But it's suffocating. Literally, sometimes. So how do I deal with this paralyzing necessity to go away? Wow. Great. Uh, great letter. This is um, this is a pretty big deal. And um, 
Manuela is very active on her Twitter. Mm -hmm. She's, (laughs) she's fun (laughs) to kind of communicate with. Um, first off, I got to say, uh, let's, let's start with the positive things. Mm -hmm. Congratulations on your academic success. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like that's going in the right direction. Huge. Um, the love life sounds like that's going well. Yes. So it, the, the reason why I always like to start there is because sometimes it can feel overwhelming when you focus on all the things that are not going well. Like that, those are the attention grabbers right there. The right. things that the day-to-day inconveniences and the struggles that we have, those are the things that are fresh on our mind and it becomes really easy to focus on those things and lose sight of some other really big, important things that are happening. Yeah. And you're thinking about relocating to the U.S.? That's awesome. We'd love to have you. Yeah. Um, yes, I, I think some of what you're talking about as far as, uh, you know, you said that you realize that this is a stepping stone. Hmm. Um, the first thing I would encourage you to take a look at are what are your expectations? Because ultimately – that's what's kind of causing this whole thing. Hmm. Whatever whatever it is, whatever your expectations are, they're not being met. So you either have to adjust the environment to be able to meet those expectations or you have to adjust the expectations to survive in the environment. Yeah. One of those two things has to happen. And it's not uncommon for a lot of people in a situation like this to not really even be fully aware of what their expectations are. Yeah. We have expectations that sometimes are almost kind of subconscious. Like they're so ingrained in us. Right. That we don't even realize what they are until we're in a situation where they're not being met. And then in that moment, we know we're unhappy. We know we're frustrated, but we can't exactly figure out why. And I like how you led. I like the the first thing I want to throw out to her is let's get a few perspectives on this, right? Because there's a lot going on. And I really appreciate how you started with it with, hey, context, right? Mm -hmm. So I call this a Barstow problem. And and I'll explain why. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) You're chuckling because I think you already know where I'm going with this. (laughs) A little bit. So we live in Las Vegas and a lot of Las Vegans enjoy going to see the beach. And it turns out you have to go to California to do that. (laughs) There's no beach in Yeah. I moved to Las Vegas for the surfing and I was very disappointed. Very disappointed. Not as advertised. Yeah. One star. (laughs) So so we have to pass uh, through this little town called Barstow. And uh, Barstow is um, not a glorious place. It, it is actually a real town. They have like a mall and they have uh, some form of commerce. But mostly they have the uh, 15 North <laughs> just burning through that thing. But I never enjoy being in Barstow. It is almost as hot as Vegas. It has California taxes. And it is just an inglamorous place that nobody I think. But I, I look around and realize there's houses there. Like there's people that live there, right? Mm-hmm. So I call it a Barstow problem because for you, this problem is temporary. And so it's actually a good problem to have because you have finished your university studies, because you have a very serious relationship with somebody who's not in your country. You are now able to dream and fantasize about reaching a destination that is not Barstow. And and that is huge because if my car breaks down and I am SOL stuck in Barstow for the rest of my life, that has deep existential consequences for me. But if I'm pit stopping there or I have a flat tire there and I'm being inconvenienced, I'm stuck there for a temporary amount of time. Yes, I long to get to the beach. Yes, I am frustrated by not getting to the beach. But I want to point out that frustration, anger, angst is superior to depression and dread and sorrow. Mm. I don't hear hopelessness in this letter. Right. I hear eagerness. That is what we call in therapy a good problem. Mm-hmm. Now, that's not to minimize your problem or your suffering, but let's put it in context. It is a good problem because your conflict is evidence of a future that doesn't look like your present, and it is that desire to boost forward that desire to inherit the destiny that is what's frustrating and 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 slowing you down and can tanker us in the moment and that's okay because it is evidence that the future is bright so i think it's a good problem to have i agree so it sounds like between the my advice and your advice it's kind of somewhere in the middle where there has to be a realistic expectation yeah right but 
to Jim's point, there has to also be some kind of long-term goal. Like I'm not happy being where I'm currently at and it's perfectly fine not to be happy where we're at. We should never be a hundred percent content, right? Yes. We should always be striving to, to do something. I mean, I've been in this job for 15 years. There's still a lot of stuff that I want to learn. There's a lot of things that I'm not content with in my career. There are things that I really need to get better at. And not only that, but just in life in general, um, outside of my work, there are things in my life that I'm not content with. Right. I'm very happy. I'm, I'm very happy with a lot of progress that I've made. Um, I'm learning Spanish, but I'm not there yet. Yeah. <laughs> I want to get further in that, you know, so there's, there's this balance that has to exist. Yeah. Right. But that anticipation of the future mm -hmm. is, I think, this beautiful problem. In the sense that whenever we are anticipating a, a better future, we feel very unsatisfied with our present. And that dissatisfaction and anticipation swirls together and it usually comes out feeling like frustration and stuck. And she mm -hmm. says that. I feel stuck. But mm -hmm. am I? I don't know. I'm in transit. My friend, right. you're in Barstow. Right. And if you're stuck there for a long time, you certainly are not happy about it. But you have to remember that you're in a transitional phase of life. So that's my first note is let's zoom out from your problem. And look at the storyline of where you are in your life. You are in a chapter and this chapter is my transition to a better life. I have built the foundation. I am ready for launch and now we are counting down to my launch. And that feeling of that countdown, 10, 9, 8, has this sense of stress and anticipation and fearfulness and let's just get it over with, rip the bandaid off. And that's exactly where you're at. But let's talk about how to cope. Because mm -hmm. you're currently in that stuck place. You're currently in Barstow. So let's figure out how to cope with Barstow. You're stuffing your feelings. You want to cry at work because your boss is literally uh, verbally abusive and pushing you down. And you just feel overwhelmed. You hate your job. Even though you've earned it, even though there's a measure of respect and there's a matter, measure of attainment, you, you switch departments and now you don't like what you're doing. You, you, you say that it's getting you to a place where you're emotionally just broken. So let's talk a little bit about how to cope with that. Mm -hmm. One of the first things I'm going to ask you to do, and this sounds like a just cliche therapist thing. Guys, I cannot – overstate the value of journaling, um, putting your stuff down, languaging your, your experience as a human, languaging the emotion words inside of you, languaging the story is itself therapeutic and healing. And a lot of people don't see that, Nick. They don't understand that they're metabolizing an energy inside of them and they're digesting and processing and turning it into something. And, and that process of languaging is itself relieving and stress reducing each day. And so if you're not already journaling, that's something I really want you to be doing. And then the second thing I want you to be doing also in writing is life planning. One of the things, Nick, that she says that she's doing is fantasizing. I love that. I love that. That'll get you through prison is thinking about the cheeseburger you're going to get on day one. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you're stuck on your hundredth day of prison in a two year term, one of the best things you can do is sit down and start writing out your plans for when you get out. First month, here's what I'm going to do. Here's the objectives I have. Here are the things I need to make sure I take care of. Where am I going to find a place to rent? All right, I better start looking up some some prices in these different states. Let's look up the industry. Let's go on the job market. And, and even though there can be a sense of like you're looking through a looking glass, like you're looking through a telescope and that's far away from you, it's unsatisfying, there's this hope that begins to flare up inside of you and you begin to simulate a different reality, a future reality. I want you to do that as often as possible, not just because it will give you the courage and not just because it will feel like it's preparing you for the next step ahead, but because it will nourish you now as you're in this jail kind of sentence of reality. You've got to think outside of the prison. Put your mind outside of it and you'll notice that you're able to sustain yourself inside of it. And I think that kind of goes with um, my advice that I was getting to with, you know, changing the meaning behind something, you know. And one of the things that you said is identifying this as a stepping stone. I like that because that that identifies this as being this has purpose itself. Yes. I, I can be uncomfortable right now and I can deal with it. I can cope with it. And I'm just speaking for me personally, I can be in uncomfortable situations and I can cope really well when I see that my discomfort has purpose mm. and it's leading towards something. So if I'm in a very uncomfortable situation, but I can reframe it 
I can use that cognitive restructuring and I can say, okay, this absolutely sucks right now, but by doing this, I'm going to be prepared for when that opportunity happens. Mm -hmm. When that next job comes along, I'm going to be able to jump into that. And by me going through all of these steps and all these things, all these challenges that I have to uh, experience and survive, by me doing that, I am preparing myself for the next thing. Yeah, It's kind of like this, um, and I'm not a religious person, so this kind of sounds funny coming from me, (laughs) but this idea that like there's some kind of planning or there's some kind of Mm. purpose. Like all of these negative things that I've gone through in my life have prepared me to excel at the right time. Yeah. When opportunities present itself, I'm there, I'm ready, and I've already done the hard work. Yeah. Right. So I think that's true. So it's a it's just kind of a way of reframing it. And this is where I think it ties in closely with the journaling, because when you journal, the thing that I like to encourage my clients to do when they journal is then go back and read it later and then look at cognitive distortions. Mm -hmm. Look at things that we're writing down that when we look at it a second time, we can say, uh, okay, that may not be completely true. Yeah, That is a little bit distorted. I guess I don't really have the facts to support that conclusion. Maybe that's right. inaccurate. But by writing stuff down, it helps you go back and identify those things. Yeah. Now, that being said, I'm going to go completely to the opposite extreme here and say that if the environment is that bad and it's that abusive – Maybe this isn't a training exercise. Yeah. Maybe this is just time to go. There's and a that's, time for that. That's yeah. that's a line that, you know, being all the way up here in Las Vegas in the United States, I can't identify for you. Yeah. I think that's something that you kind of have to identify. Where is that line? When is enough enough? You know, what at what point does this go from being something that is just resistance that I am getting stronger by going through it? And when do we cross over into, yeah, you know what, this I, I am being abused at work and this isn't really helping me in the long run. Yeah. You know, and, and I don't I can't define I can define that for me. Right. I can't define that for somebody else. I think a few notes on that. You know, first, to the point of cognitive distortions, if you're feeling despair or hopeless in your life, it is very likely that you are probably experiencing a cognitive distortion. A cognitive distortion is like a mental mirage. It's an untrue interpretation of the world around you. It's a perception thing. If you perceive the world or or your reality as catastrophic, everything bad that can happen will happen. This is only going to get worse um, or, or, or any other kind of spell of negativity. The experiences you're going to have in your heart, in your mind, in your life and the behaviors you're going to have uh, that you're going to put out outwardly are usually the wrong ones because you didn't have access to the real map. You didn't know what was really there. You you were seeing a false illusion uh, view of reality. So I think that's a good challenge. Also to Nick's point about the harder you work, the luckier you get. I do think that that's, that's like a, a rule of the universe mm-hmm. and I don't think it necessarily is something that only theists can believe in. I think that the drop of water doesn't understand the topography of the land and why it ends up going toward the ocean. Right. But I think that there's like this, this balanced beam of the universe where the harder you work, the luckier you do get and more opportunities seem to come your way if for only probability reasons. You know, you play enough hands of poker, eventually you can win. So I think that there's that too. And then the last point about, you know, living in another country, um, she did tell us where she lives and, and she also asked us not to reveal that. And it's very telling to me whenever I read a letter like this because as an American, it really helps me understand that, you know, we have the luxury in a lot of ways. Now, granted, times have changed. You know, you now mm-hmm. need two incomes to survive. You can't just get by with a union job and just go, you know, you, you got to go get all these levels of education. You got to burden yourself with debt. There's a lot of things that America needs to change. But even as bad as America is, and I would definitely not say we're in our best days right now as a citizen, it is incalculably different than the reality of somebody who lives in another country Mm -hmm. where they literally might just have to sustain abuse and be unhealthy because there is no other option or the way their economy works or their political structure works or whatever, their very livelihood or health or life or freedom may honestly be in danger Mm -hmm. if they even let on that they're unhappy. And, you know, you look at some of these countries and think, my gosh, you know, what must that be like and what must these people have to sustain? They really become a case study in how you cope with unbearable stresses in life and overcome. 
And I'll tell you, Nick, in a lot of ways, that's what makes America so powerful is people like this that immigrate here, that have been through hell. And then they come here and they work their butts off and right. they really bring the thunder. Yeah. And it's because, dude, they have been carrying a weight that we can't even imagine. And then they get here and they are buff. And it's like they, they have the mental stamina to keep up and excel. So, you know, Manuela, I mean, my, my encouragement to you is that you hang in there. You know, I'm not coming at you with any dad advice. Uh, there's that dad advice <laughs> in me of like, well, if work was great, they wouldn't have to pay you to be there. You know? <laughs> like, it always sucks, kid. Uh, so there's there's a little bit of that. But, you know, that larger story of just coming alongside you, encouraging you, uh, you know, you're going to make it. OK, and I want you to fantasize about it. Uh, another thing that could be really helpful, Nick, is to make a dream board. That's something we've had clients do in the past. And a dream board is whenever you you go through magazines and Internet articles and you print pictures uh, or you cut out pictures that capture these these elements of the future that you hope to have for yourself, poems, excerpts, and you put all this on a poster board and you hang this in your room. And that way, every time you look at it, you're reminded of the destiny ahead of you, of the things you're working toward. That's the stuff that will get you through. But remind yourself that your present is not your future, that your destiny, your destination is not your, your current predicament, and that anticipation often feels like frustration. But this is a Barstow problem and you're on your way somewhere better. Mm-hmm. Very good. Thank you for writing in. Okay, we're going to take a short break. When we come back, we will answer a question about therapeutic modalities. You're listening to Pod Therapy. Hey, Therapals. How would you like to be a part of a live recording of Pod Therapy? Of course you would. You can, and a whole lot more, when you buy your ticket to ScoopFest 2018. This is the third annual ScoopFest put on by our friends Matt, Paul, and Jacob from the Ice Cream Social Podcast, a weekend-long comedy and podcast festival in beautiful Las Vegas, Nevada, coming up on October 12th through the 14th. Enjoy live comedy, variety shows, the Scoop Talent Show. I know Jim's preparing for that. He's getting super excited. And the Jock vs. Nerd Costume Ball. And much, much more, including live recordings of Matt and Matt Lee's Ice Cream Social, Pod Therapy, and some of your other favorite podcasts. So get your tickets now. Go on over to HeyScoops.com. There will be a discount code for our listeners. That code is THERAPY. So that's HeyScoops.com, discount code THERAPY. Get your tickets today. All right, we're back. You're listening to Pod Therapy. Our next listener writes in anonymously and is asking about therapeutic models. Okay, this letter says, is CBT the same as DBT? So CBT, just before we even read the question, is cognitive behavioral therapy, and DBT is dialectical behavioral therapy. So he's asking, are these the same? Or she, I don't know, it's anonymous. Okay, here's the letter. In the latest episode, there was talk of using cognitive behavioral therapy to help clients. In therapy, I've used dialectical behavioral therapy as a way to help with anxiety, depression, and low self-esteem issues. Are there benefits in using one over the other? Thank you, anonymous. Okay. Um, yeah, they, they are a little bit different. Um, so DBT, and I'm just going to give my, my best, uh, explanation behind this. Um, I've had no actual formal training in DBT, but I know enough about it to kind of give you the basic understanding, basic uh, description. So within DBT, there are components of cognitive behavioral therapy. The big thing that DBT is used for, uh, it was created actually by uh, Marsha Linehan, um, who herself was diagnosed with um, borderline personality disorder. Uh, she developed this because so many therapists were really getting uh, fatigued and burnt out working with this one population. So she tried finding something that was going to be beneficial. DBT... Uh, the dialectical part of it um, really kind of focuses on the balance between um, acceptance and change. Mm -hmm. So that's where DBT is a little bit different than CBT. It, it has that extra focus. So to kind of, it's hard to explain, but basically it's, it's being able to identify what things we are going to have to learn how to accept and what things we are going to actively work on behavioral change 
to to create a different outcome. So are there benefits to using one over the other? Um, yes, uh, both can be very effective. DBT is especially effective when working with individuals who struggle with emotional regulation. So if that describes you, DBT might be a good, uh, a good therapeutic model for you. Uh, one of the things also that's important with DBT is that DBT also has with it, in addition to individual therapy, you would be doing skills groups. And these skills groups really focus on uh, the development and use of DBT skills that then would be used in conjunction with therapy. Uh, CBT doesn't really have that necessarily. You can do CBT in just individual sessions, but DBT, um, it has that extra component, that group skills component, which is very important. Yeah. So the essence of it is this DBT is a form of CBT. So again, we like to define terms on this show. So cognitive behavioral therapy was this, uh, psychotherapeutic technique developed by Dr. Aaron Beck. And Dr. Beck at the time was really studying depression and anxiety. And if you've ever had depression or anxiety, it feels like it's like coming out of nowhere. And it's really frustrating when somebody says, Hey, if you just cheer up, you know, or Hey, calm down. And it feels like, dude, it's hard to explain. It's outside of my control. I don't have the ability to deal with this. Dr. Beck realized that there was kind of like this chain reaction of things that sort of lead to that experience. And he sort of revealed to us how the brain works, that uh, a situation or event might happen. We might have like an automatic thought to that. And if we choose to believe that emotion or that automatic thought, we might enter into a cognitive distortion, which we talked about earlier in the show, which is a false interpretation of reality. It's like a funhouse mirror version of reality. And he said, hey, if you're wearing these beer goggles and interpretation of the world, you're going to bump into stuff and you're going to experience life poorly and you're going to have anxiety, you're going to have depression, you might drink too much, you might have these problems. What happened with DBT, dialectical behavioral therapy, was that while CBT is very effective, it's particularly difficult to use it with people who have borderline personality disorder. So borderline personality disorder, which we've covered in a previous episode, is sort of that I hate you or I love you, don't leave me, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's that that disability to balance boundaries with other people in your life and you have this pattern of self-destructive social behavior where you cling to people and let them into your world way too quickly and give them way too much power and then also forcefully, explosively push them away and sort of eviscerate relationships at the drop of a hat as well. And so it's this explosive uh, and, and also very grasping sort of personality habit which we call borderline personality disorder. So the reason that we call this a dialectic is actually a reference to Hegelian philosophy. So Hegel wrote a form of philosophy called the dialectic and basically his argument was you can take a thesis, which is a statement of truth, and an antithesis or an antithesis, which is the exact opposite of that truth. And if you bring those together in conversation, the real reality is usually somewhere in the middle. So opposites, opposites. Can, can coexist. Yes. Let these two things coexist together and you'll find that a lot of truth is revealed by fusing together two contradictory things. So whenever dialectic behavioral therapy was created, it was with that concept of the borderline person who is at once in love with you and also contradictorily the antithesis of love, absolute hate with you and is capable of flipping very violently between the two. So dialectical tries to fuse these two together to create normal, healthy boundary relationships, which is why a big part of it that makes it different than CBT CBT can be done individually and may use groups. That's fine. Mm -hmm. DBT doesn't want to be done individually. Right. DBT wants groups and it has a strong emphasis on what we call psychosocial, uh, which is that psychology of how humans interact with each other. And a lot of the skills that you're building actually have to do with how to fuse people back together in healthy boundaries by comparing those two opposites. Yeah. So with the, with the opposites, uh, to kind of give you an example, um, mom says she loves me, but she's mad at me because of this behavior I did. Right. For people who struggle with that, this is where DBT would be beneficial. These two are opposites, but they can coexist. Yeah. It's working on fusing those two together and understanding the they two they fit together. Yeah. And you know, the other part of the question was about uh, one thing being more useful than the other. And here's a fascinating fact that a lot of our, our listeners don't know, but uh, every clinician uh, had to learn this at one point. So whenever we're going through our studies in graduate school and we're learning about psychotherapy and about different techniques, 
uh, there comes a time when you take a class where they introduce you to like a dozen different techniques. And it's really funny because one of the first things they warn you is there is no technique that's better than the other techniques. And that's very confusing because all the techniques beat the placebo, right? Like all mm-hmm. of them beat nothing. Uh, and all of them beat non-evidence-based ideas like just, you know, just throwing a book at it or let's go out and just do push-ups or coming up with some dumb idea. All the techniques that are evidence-based, that are good psychology, science-based, uh, they are effective. But we've never seen that any of them are more effective than the others for everything. CBT has like a really good winning record when it comes to things like depression and anxiety. DBT has a really strong record when it comes to borderline. So they have different areas where they're the best uh, approach. And I usually compare it to uh, MMA fighting, right? So like UFC, uh, two people go in the cage and they're allowed to punch, they're allowed to kick, they're allowed to wrestle, they're allowed to throw people, they're allowed to do anything they want as long as they beat up the bad guy. And that's how psychotherapy is. We all have different approaches. You know, just like some people use karate, some people use boxing, some people use wrestling. Some uh, uh, clinicians will use uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. Some will use solution-focused brief treatments. Some will use systems modalities like uh, family systems theory. Some will use narrative therapy. I mean, there's all these different ideas. There's Adlerian therapy. There's Freudian psychoanalysis. Um, And I'd love to eventually do a show where we just one by one explain what these are. But uh, I just know the listener would fall asleep. So I'm 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 nerding. Out over I'm here, Nick. Sorry, I, I need wasn't you to listening. Me. What? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not listening. <laughs> Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah. Uh, I promise our live show will be way more entertaining <laughs> than Jim providing a lecture on all the different forms of psychotherapy and why they're different and what they're good at. But yeah. suffice it to say, the answer to the question of is one better than the other? No. No, they're not. Um, if you have a, a skilled clinician who utilizes one effectively, they will probably beat the problem. Mm-hmm. Very good. That's all the time that we've got for this week's session. Thank you to those who contributed to our show today. We really appreciate it. Remember, pod therapy isn't something you should keep all to yourself. Help us reach others by sharing this episode. You can find us at facebook.com slash pod therapy or on Twitter at pod therapy guys. Do you want to add your own advice to today's questions? Post your thoughts at podtherapy.net and join the conversation. I'm Nick Tangerman. I'm Dr. Aaron Beck. <laughs> Thanks, and we'll see you for your appointment next week. And don't forget to buy tickets for Scoop, Scoop Fest 2018. Heyscoops.com, discount code THERAPY.